life. It's just, it's just one big story, isn't it? Welcome to the Story Connection. I'm your host, Donna Wahlberg. Well, tonight's story is going to be a little disturbing. It's a, a story that's very compelling. It's something that needs to be brought out into the open. We are going to be talking about human trafficking. And the person that is going to be speak, speaking tonight has an insight into what's going on and has experienced some of this firsthand. So let's take a look at this. <music> Welcome, Linda Belarus. It's so nice to have you on the show. Thank you. What a, you know, a, a hero, you know, to to come out and, and talk about this. You know, most people want to forget about their past or want to forget about the things they've experienced. But you've actually taken the bull by the horns and you've written a book. Yes. And, um, and you're an advocate. Yes, I am. So let's start at the beginning. How did How did this all happen for you? Well, I grew up in a small community, a vineyard community up in Northern California, and went off to college. I was just a normal kid and went off to college and a bit naive. I met a man on a street corner who reached out to me and started flirting with me, and I fell in love, so I thought. Um, turned out over time, I didn't know in the beginning that he was actually a pimp, what I now call a trafficker. And there's different types of pimps in the world. There's the gorilla pimps, and you know that's a pimp because mm -hmm. they will beat you, chain you, have you gang raped, um, beat you into submission, basically. And then the Romeo pimps, or traffickers, uh, tell you they love you. And they gift you things and time and love and they, what we call grooming. They groom you. And then they put you on a street corner. So that was my story. I was a college, like I said, a college student. I had a, a good family. I had a support system. And it's because of that that he didn't reach the goals he wanted that my very first night standing on a street corner in San Francisco, totally humiliated, I was able to reach down and, and say, you know what? No. Oh, good for you. No. Uh, but I stayed with him. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until a beating that happened um, months later that I was finally able to wake up and say, this can't be love. What am, what am I doing for love? What am I doing in this life of mine? And here I wanted to be a sociologist, and I'm being manipulated and, and abused. So uh, the difference is, is that I had someone to reach out to. Mm. I had someone to reach out to, and a lot of girls today don't. Yeah. That's got to make a big difference. And when you feel like you're alone and isolated in this, plus it's embarrassing and and I'm sure that, you know, during this process, you probably weren't even sure what it was you had gotten yourself into. Exactly. Yeah. I just thought he loved me. Uh, Perpetrators, traffickers, pimps, they look for young, vulnerable, needy 
girls. So when we're talking about that word need, they're looking for someone who needs love, affection, attention. My problem was very low self-esteem. I was 220 some pounds and although I had been popular in high school and vivacious, I never felt okay inside. So that was my need. I needed somebody handsome to love me, to make me feel accepted. And he did. Other p young girls, their need is different. They may need a home. Mm -hmm. They may need a, a house over, you know, to move into or food or safety or protection from somebody else abusing them. So the uh, pimps are expert manipulators and they're on the prowl and they are looking for young, vulnerable, needy girls. Now, they also get others, other girls, to bring more fresh meat, if to put it bluntly, into the fold. Do you have any uh, insight as, as to how that works as, as far as the, the girls start manipulating other girls as well? Well, they bring them into the stable, mm -hmm. and usually it's the perpetrator's main woman. Okay. And so she's sure that he loves her, and they're doing this now as a couple. So she's not only making money for him, but she recruits other girls or walks up to a young runaway. There's a direct correlation between runaways and sex traffic girls, mm -hmm. and there's a direct correlation between foster care runaways and sex traffic girls. So it could be the pimp or it could be uh, a woman who meets these girls and reaches out and says, come, we'll help you. And they do. Mm -hmm. And they feed them and they house them and they groom them. And then the manipulation starts either through force and abuse or through, okay, you now, you love me, you now need to go make us money. And that's what I talk about in my story. Hmm. That's incredible. So from... That experience in San Francisco, you happened to get into a cult? How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, from once I ran away from Raymond, mm -hmm. um, I tried to start over. And this was during the hippie days of San Francisco. He put a contract out on my life, and he was going to have me killed. And I ran from our small mm -hmm. town where we had been, and I went to the big city of San Francisco, and a few other things happened, and I got to the point on a beach in San Francisco on June 13th, 1971, where I wanted to die. Mm. And it was like all of my decisions had been terrible, and I was staring at the consequences of, ter of the aftermath of terrible decisions I had made. And I just looked out into the ocean and was going to walk out and just walk until I drowned. I had no other reason to go on living. I was ashamed and broken, embarrassed, and I couldn't even tell people, my family, my parents, of, of the degradation that I had gone through. Mm. So that day on that beach, I finally just said, God, if you're real. Show me. And within minutes, a group of young kids came walking down the beach playing guitars, oh. hippie clothes, sat down on the beach next to me and said, let me tell you about Jesus. Oh, boy. And I said, no. I didn't want anything to do with Jesus people. I was not a somebody running off to a church. And so I, I rebelled, and I just said no. And they sat with me and for five hours ministering, what's called ministering to me. And I, the dam finally broke, and I started to cry. And I just let it all out. And they reached out their hands and said, come. And I ended up joining Excuse me, I ended up joining the Children of God Religious Commune that day on June 13th. And what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I had, in a different way, given uh -huh. away my power to be under Raymond's strong hand, I had now given away my power to a religious leader. 
except it felt different. I felt alive and I felt powerful and, I, and we were the last generation and we were going to tell the world that the world was coming to an end and to get out and to um, find the Lord and find purpose. And I traveled with them for two years and I loved it. I, I, I don't regret any of that. I was in jail. In fact, the book opens, Dear Mom and Dad, I'm in jail. <laughs> uh, I was in jail with this group in Mexico. And everything was okay until the leader changed. And he started sending out directives and missives and instructions that were tearing down what I believed in. And uh, I decided I needed to get out. And I planned an escape Wow. And I got up. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you go from there? Uh, my parents. God bless my parents. Um, I was in Central America when this happened. So oh they goodness. sent me a ticket and they brought me back to Northern California. And they thought, okay, she's home. She's safe. I was going to go back to college, finish my degree. And then one day I was preparing for a television interview on my life in the Children of God. And I was questioning my higher power about what am I going to say when they ask me what I'm going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. And I heard a voice that's inside me, a chest, this soft, gentle voice that said, go back to Costa Rica and open a home for street girls, for young girls. Oh, my goodness. And I said, okay. And I stood up and I called my poor parents and said, I'm leaving. And I went on television and I said, I'm leaving. And I bought myself a one-way ticket back to San Jose, Costa Rica, and I got on a plane and I went back. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Linda. And Linda, with that's amazing. the help of some wonderful people, from the First Lady of the Republic of Costa mm -hmm. Rica, Doña Karen de Figueres, a wonderful priest. I, mean, I had written to Doña Karen, the First Lady, and said, I want to work for your country with the youth. And I'd written to a Catholic priest. Not being Catholic, but I'd had this friend. He was a Catholic priest. And uh, she wrote back, and she said, contact me when you get here. And he wrote back and said, I'll pick you up at the airport. And I got on a plane. <laughs> and I went back to Costa Rica. And with the help of some wonderful people, we opened the House of Hope for street girls, underage prostitutes, and runaways. My goodness. Yes. How did, um, I imagine there's, there's a lot of that going on as well there. So how was this received? Um, this this house that you were off the safe haven yeah uh very well actually we had political people in our camp so mm -hmm. you know we had uh, affirmation from the first lady and senators and political priests and good people in the christian community so i walked the streets at night talking to young girls and negotiating with pimps on territory see in costa rica prostitution is illegal but not for minors. But nobody was dealing with that part of the issue. Mm. And um, we set out to make a change. Just like now, as it was then and continues to be, if a young girl is caught up in the sex trade and has no place to go, where is she going to go? Yeah. So we were the first, the first home. Wow. That's, That's amazing. And how dangerous. <laughs> it had to be dangerous. Yeah, a lot of things in my life were probably yeah. dangerous if I looked at them that way. Yeah. You know, living with a pimp, being beat up by a pimp, negotiating territory with a pimp in the red yeah. light zone in Central America. A lot of that, being in a Mexican jail and taken out of the jail with rifles and put into a van and driven a lot. But I've been blessed and protected. My goodness. So you have this breakthrough. You go and you, you set up this. How, how long were you there with uh, working with the girls? The House of Hope was open two years, and I turned it over to the government, mm -hmm. and they carried on the House of Hope. And I came back to actually go back to college this time and get a degree and, and uh, start my profession and have my children. And then I wrote my book, 
um, clueless to what was going to happen. And as the book started getting momentum and people talking, and they would say, well, what about the sex trade here? So I naively <laughs> went on to Google, <laughs> what do you mean about the sex trafficking? And I had just been clueless for years in my own world mm -hmm. and um, realized, wow, we have a huge problem right here in California, right here in the United States, and Sacramento and one of two safe havens that exist in California are here in Auburn. Hmm. And I had to raise my hand and say, how can I help? Wow. So I've heard, you know, and, and I'm one of those too that was clueless that there was so much activity going on in Sacramento. We've done a, a, a another show uh, where we brought on a lawyer who was helping girls, but um, let's talk a little bit more. What, you know, what's being done? What, what can people do? Uh, where can girls go? My, there's minor girls and there's of age girls. Okay. And they really are two different segments. There are homes and programs for the older girls that want to get out of the trade. And at my website, lindabayoruiz.com, I have resources there. Uh, Weave is here in Sacramento, and they have resources. Cash, C-A-S-H, is here in Sacramento with resources. Um, Californians Against Slavery is here. But then there's the minors. Mm -hmm. So to help a minor, you have to have a licensed home residential, long-term residential treatment home. There are only two in California. My goodness. One in Van Nuys and one here in the Auburn area with only six beds, um, feverishly earning money, um, begging, having, we're having a marathon this coming weekend to raise money. It's called, uh, the organization is called Courage Worldwide. They're also on my website and their home here in Auburn is called Courage House. And they have six beds, only six beds, have turned away 100 and 112 girls oh just recently, goodness. the youngest being nine, because there's no beds. And they're allowed six. But they have 50 acres, and they're looking to build nine more cottages on that same property uh, with the ability to have six girls in each cottage. And then um, more beds are needed and more homes are needed. Uh, we've got up to 300,000 girls in the United States that need where to go because they can't go back home. Mm -hmm. They've already been abused at home. They've already run away. They've been in foster care after foster care, and they've run away. Where are they going to go? We need homes, and that's what Courage Worldwide is doing. So when you're saying, I'm trying to picture, you know, nine-year-olds, you know, running away from home and, and getting caught up in something like this, how does this happen? A nine-year-old, given that age, probably didn't run away. She was probably sold. Parents have been known to sell their children into the sex trade. Oh One goodness. of my heart girls down in Costa Rica, because there's a safe haven there that I mentor and that I visit, she was put into prostitution by her mother when she was 11. So there's all kinds of terrible, terrible stories. Um, so it depends on the AIDS. They're not all runaways, just so many of them are. Um, there's other ways that they would have gotten caught up into sex trafficking as well. So when they come to you, how, how do they find you, for one? Well, well the FBI does, has all type, has task force, number mm -hmm. one. FBI has task force. It's their job to rescue these girls. That's not ours. That's not mine anymore. Okay. Um, they rescue the girls and they go into the juvenile justice system and then they need to be placed. They're, of course, they're looking for the court system. The juvenile court system is looking for family, for parents, for somebody. And if there is nobody, then they're looking for beds. And, and the girls that go back into foster care, we have to realize, aren't getting the care they need. I love foster care, and there's wonderful foster care parents. Mm -hmm. But these girls have PTSD. 
Yeah. They've been brutally traumatized. They've been raped. They've been put out to be raped 10 to 15 times a day, seven days a week. You can't just hug them and put them into some home. You need quality therapeutic care. Yeah. And that's what we are working at getting. Wow. Well, believe it or not, we're running out of time here. We've got five minutes left in the show. So why don't you give your information a little bit and sure. kind of uh, let everybody know where they can where they can help, where they can find your book. Sure. Um, my book is available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. It is my story, but it's not just terribleness. It's, that's why it's called Tears to Triumph. There is triumph. So it's my story. It's the story of other girls uh, that came to me in Costa Rica and that lived with me. So it's Tears to Triumph because there is hope, which is why I called it the House of Hope. Um, my website um, lindabelloruiz.com lindabelloruiz.com Amazon for the book on my website is our links to Courage Worldwide which is courageworldwide.org they are always looking for volunteers and on their website it says volunteer Um, then I'm doing a presentation on July 9th in Rockland at the Rockland Golf Club second floor and that is being hosted by St. Michael's uh, Independent Catholic Church. And I'll be speaking on statistics and how girls get caught up in this and how we can help them get out. My goodness. You're a busy girl. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, let's give a little bit of information about the story connection. The Story Connection airs the second and fourth Thursday at 9.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Our companion show, Paranormal Connection, airs the first and third Thursdays of each month. Each episode repeats the following Friday at 1.30 p.m. and Saturday at 5.30 a.m. Watch these programs online at the same airtimes by going to accesssacramento.org and clicking Watch 17. In the Sacramento region, you can see us on Comcast Channel 17 and on AT&T Channel 99. You can find previously aired shows on the Story Connection YouTube channel. For information on upcoming shows and previous Story Connection guests, go to storyconnectiontv.blogspot.com. You can contact us at storyconnectiontv at gmail.com. And don't forget, find us on Facebook, become a friend, and become a fan. Wow. Linda, this has been such a, an amazing topic, and I so appreciate you coming to be informative and um, being so open about, um, you know, everything you've been through, and what a journey. What a journey for you. So my last question to you is what advice do you have for young girls who may be watching the show or people who know of young girls that may be watching the show? Uh, what can what can you tell us in the last couple minutes? There's a FBI hotline, mm-hmm. tip hotline, where girls can call, um, or anybody who knows of a young girl can call, and um, they will get help. Weave um, again is an, another group that can help here in Sacramento and other resources that are on my website. But there is a way out. We all have a story. Mm-hmm. As you had said when we were talking previously, these girls don't even know they're in the midst of their story, but they yeah. are. And you can write, rewrite your story and you can write a new chapter. There is hope and there is a way out. Wonderful. Well, let's give another plug for the race that's coming up. The Courage Run, we have a marathon this coming weekend. And then um, that's to raise funds mm-hmm. for Courage House. And then I have my presentation on July 9th at the Rockland Golf Course. Okay. So anybody out there who's interested in becoming involved, you know, there are places you can, you can, you know, get information, go to Linda's website. And, you know, gosh, you know, the more hands, the better. Yes. And, uh, you know, we, yes. we can't turn this around. Yes. Right. So thank you so much again for coming so on the show and um, your wonderful book. Thanks for writing it so that we can be more informed. Thank you. And uh, for all that you do. And there's hashtag not in my city. Ah, I love it. Hashtag not in my city. Yes. Wonderful. 
Well, thank you again, everybody, for watching the Story Connection, and thank you to my wonderful crew for coming out, volunteering their time, so we can, you know, put information like this on the air so people can help. So it's 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 a good thing. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, and good night. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs>